Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Ramon Vega to discuss his uh, illustrious Celtic career. Ramon, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Oh, very well. I uh, hope you're well too. Yeah, under the circumstances, it's great to, to tie in with the Excels and have a wee chat about the good old days. But hopefully we can also talk about where Celtic are just now, Ramon. Do you get a chance to keep up with the developments at the club? Oh, very much. I'm very much, uh, obviously, Celtic never is going to be uh, forgotten, especially personally, because I got uh, a very good experience with Celtic uh, and, and also the supporters. The fantastic. Even was short, but very, very intense uh, and sweet in the same time. So it's never going to be forgotten. And that's why I'm very having a big eye, especially now. This season was a special season as well. So I had a uh, good eye on it as well so uh, yeah I'm definitely following Celtic Brilliant I mean see when I look back at your arrival at Celtic as I was saying to you earlier I think I've seen most of your games but um, when you look at the amount of silverware you got for the games you've played as you say it was a very sweet period in the Celtic uh, history but when you look back to your early career playing for grasshoppers making a name for yourself in Swiss football and you compare it now to the kind of standards of Swiss football in mind, obviously, with us having Albion Ayeti. Um, where is Swiss football at the moment, Ramon? Is it still a high standard? I think Swiss football is very high standard. I think it's progressed since, I, I think, our kind of period from my time in the 90s. I think that's what Swiss football really uh, had a huge impact with the overall Swiss uh, uh, football as such, because not just myself, there was Stefan Horschel in Liverpool, there was Stefan Schapisa in Dortmund, really, really top, top, top players at the time, you know, and we had a fantastic national team as well, the Euro 96, uh, and so on. I think there was a start of a huge successful period for the Swiss national team as well, as you can potentially see now, the last 10, 15 years, uh, the younger generation really improved massively, and the Swiss football has... Uh, I would say a very good high standard in terms of quality players. I'm not saying in terms of the league himself, because that, that's a completely different conversation. But the players to be used uh, from Switzerland has definitely the last 15, 20 years improved and it's, it's a high standard. You mentioned her name, Shapuza. Celtic fans will remember him well from his, his time in Dortmund as well. What a striker he was. But um, obviously we have Albion Ayeti. And just over the last couple of weeks, he's, he's come back into the side, Ramon. And we look at a player like him. Obviously you moved about yourself. You went from Switzerland to Italy before coming to Britain. Uh, Ayeti's come in. He's a fairly young man. He's um, obviously moved from Switzerland to England and then up to Scotland. How difficult is it during these times for a player to come to a club like Celtic where perhaps his family are back home, he can't integrate with his teammates? It must be really difficult. Well, I think it is very, very difficult. But, you know, when you go in the, in the journey as a football player, as a professional player, you have to uh, calculate the thing that that's going to happen in your career. You know, uh, you've got, you're a professional player, it's going to happen if you want to be an international player on top of that, not just playing in Switzerland, you will potentially most likely see that you're not, not going to see your family for a, for a while. Oh, it's happened to me as well. And when I went to Italy or even to Britain, to the UK at the beginning, it was very difficult as well. You know, it was a big change, you know, coming from Europe into the UK, especially London, tipping the atmosphere, the language, all of that had a huge impact. But if you didn't have somebody next to you, it makes it even more difficult. But, it's also a good time for somebody to mature and, and be stronger mentally in terms of how to approach yourself. You've got to learn about you get to learn about yourself as well, you know. And I think it's 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 also a good time. It's of course very difficult, but I think the players today, to my generation, uh, not biased too much, but I think they're softer compared to my generation. To be honest here, because I think uh, they been giving much more possibility than what we have at the time. We really needed to work our socks off to really even get to somewhere, especially from Switzerland, for us to go uh, play abroad and play for Tottenham or even Celtic, leave alone, you know. It was a dream, but very difficult to get. But we made pretty much the foundation for all these players that come now through, like like Lane himself, you know, everybody looks into the Swiss football, you know. So I think the, Swiss, uh, the, the generation we are in now, it's softer for certain but in the same time they also have a much better kind of platform to play football
Mm-hmm. I mean, I've mentioned Ayeti, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. He's back in the Celtic side. Um, I look at him as a player we've spent, obviously, a lot of money on, Ramon. Do you think he is someone who will progress and we will see the true Albion Ayeti maybe next season or in the coming seasons? It's a good question to say. Um, it, it, it's a very big conflict. When you start to pay quite the big dollars like that, the expectation is very, very high. That's, that's just what it is, you know. From club's point of view... To spend that kind of level of money where, from my information, he went to West Ham, didn't play as much there either, to be honest with you. Uh, it's big price to be asked to not be formed yet, you know. Uh, if he was just an loan and he improves and actually proves himself to Celtic, yes, then no, there's no, I'm not worried to pay the five million pounds, you know, for him or whatever the price he was at that time. Um, but now he will definitely has to prove himself now for the club because I think he didn't have that impact he's supposed to give Celtic. But that's the hope I think Nilan want to have. He want to have a firepower in the front, uh, not just on the national kind of games, but also the international one, the European games. You know, I don't think that really went well uh, because I think it's a player where potentially the confidence were very low. But at the same time, I don't know, I'm not sure the fitness was on the standard high. He should be, he should be you know. So that's all that together. Uh, it takes six to months to one year to even to get into uh, quality if you're supposed to keep from him, you know. But we're not seeing anything of that. I'm not sure. I hope for him because it's a fantastic club because I experienced very good experience there, you know. But he needs to know that if he plays for Celtic, he plays for a big club. Mm-hmm. And to improve himself as well. Yeah, and you know, similarly to yourself, he's gone to London first. And you know, I look at your your Twitter page, for example, Ramon. It's obvious that you've got a real fondness still for Tottenham Hotspur. Um, you look back fondly on your time there. But it's interesting for me that the the team that you were part of, the League Cup winning side, nineteen ninety nine, you're up against Martin O'Neill's Leicester at that time, and in the midfield is Neil Lennon, of course. Um, I mean, how fond are you still of the Spurs yourself? You're still down in London, I guess. Listen, I, it, it's very clear. As a player, when you play for nearly four and a half year like Tottenham Hotspurs, and it's a big club, it's a London club. It was pretty much my first club in Britain at the time. Uh, I had, you know, a great, great experience with them as well. But at the same time, when you're winning a league club like them, and see, even today, it's historical because I've not many cups they won uh, since then, you know, when I was part of the 1990 that you mentioned to. Of course, uh, I, I, I follow them and I still have uh, a lot of uh, communication with the, with the club himself. But at the same time, just talking about Celtic, for me, Celtic, even that six months I have that, is a pretty much the same impact I had like four and a half years at Spurs. So I look at both clubs, for me, uh, as my, uh, my favourite clubs to, to not just to watch, to look into it, but also it is something I'm loyal to, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when Martin O'Neill came to Celtic, Ramon, uh, we've seen a huge um, turnover, if you like, of players coming in, players going out. Um, He was transforming the club. And part of that transformation um, was in the shape of two guys who played in that cup final, Neil Lennon and then yourself. And you made your debuts uh, one game away from each other. How did you hear of that first interest from Martin O'Neill? What was your first impressions of Martin? Well, the first, uh, first uh, call came just uh, before Christmas time, I think, at that time. Um, there was an, in, uh, an interest from Celtic Glasgow. Uh, of course, my first instinct is, wow, it's a big club. There's no doubt. I don't even have to think twice. Um, and, of course, it's between the clubs. I obviously have to agree what I want to agree. It was my, my, my mind was already pretty much saying, yes, if Celtic and Martin only wants me, uh, I'm up there, absolutely not, no, even think about it, you know. And it took a about a month or so to negotiate between the clubs uh, if, I, if, if I can be released, you know. And when I got the call from Martin Neal to, to meet me on top of that down at London, when it really was getting concrete uh, about my contract, uh, it was a maximum 30 minutes meeting, and we knew instantly that that was my club straight away. I don't even have to think about it twice, you know, and I told the agent, get everything sorted out, whatever is needed to be done, because I like to play for this club, you know. And and, and it was very quick. The rest was, uh, yeah, fabulous start. Uh, I can't even, even talking now today, I get goosebumps about it. You know, just that first game against Aberdeen, you know. 
uh, just the support though, it's just uh, it's unbelievable unbelievable it's uh, something you can't really repeat you can't you know, I'm very lucky that I actually had this experience as a player because uh, I always say to all my ex-international players or all the players I know around Europe so where, and I always ask the question where do you most enjoy it you know my first club in mind is always Celtic and it's because I think it's the club himself just gives you such a warm enthusiastic welcome where it's just like a, uh, you, you just go into a very quick into and that's really had an impact on me as well and uh, and scoring straight away two goals in the first uh, game I think uh, you can't have a better start to be honest you know Oh, great memories. I mean, every home game was a 60,000 sellout. We were beating teams like Aberdeen 6 nothing in your debut, like you say. And you were surrounded with players such as, you know, Henrik Larsson, Chris Sutton, Neil Lennon. I mean, when you look back to the likes of Larsson, who obviously had a, a massive impression on, on the club, what did he do differently, Ramon? I know that, you know, he's got the, the technique and he's got natural ability, but how did he apply himself differently or was it all down to natural ability? Well, I think it's a mixture of both, to be honest with you. I think Henry Glass and what, what he has is he was a typical kind of uh, 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 striker. He had the instinct. He knew exactly when to run and when to run behind uh, the defender, you know. For us as centre-half, John Yalby in, in the back, we were delighted to have somebody in front of us because every time we put the, front, the ball fr- uh, front, we actually could relax a little bit, you know, and have a breather and don't have to defend all the time because we know we've got Henry Glass in the front that's doing something, you know. But I think with the, the combination with Chris Sutton together really helped a lot, I think, for Henry Glass's game as well because I think that, uh, Chris Sutton was fantastic holding the ball in front. He was a big fella as well. And I think the combination between these two was fantastic. Even for us, as, as the centre half, we had an option. You always knew whatever happens, you always have a good look on uh, Chris Sutton, have a chip into him, and you know that Henry Glass and just go around him, you know. And that's, we scored many goals like that, you know. I think the natural instinct of Henry Glass was really, really that kind of. Uh, 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 special about him or even uh, defending him in the, in the training grounds you know it was difficult because I, was, I remember the first week I nearly injured him <laughs> I thought oh god my career is already finished so I think, you know but um, it, it, it was difficult because in one stage you thought you're marking you have him really under control and suddenly he disappears silently you know it was not the kind of the scream uh, very quiet silent but he had the instinct he was always there where where it's danger in the 80 yards box, and that's just a uh, fantastic talent. And he was great for Celtic. I think he's without a doubt a, a major legend there. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And we look back on that period as well as a time when Martin O'Neill really galvanised the club, Ramon. He brought us the success that we so craved after a really poor season the year before. And I've, I've heard from some of your ex teammates that he wasn't really a training ground manager. Is that, would you say that was the case? It was more John Robertson and Steve Walford. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I can join my ex players as well. I, I was, for me, was very surprised because on the continent you got this very hands-on coach on the ground doing the training sessions and everything. And Steve Wolf and, and Robson, fantastic two assistant coach. I think that that, that makes also a big difference. It's, it depends who you have as your right hand man or two assistants. You know, Martin O'Neill really gave full confidence and responsibility to these two, and these two really gave also the kind of the attitude, the, the, the kind of the team uh, spirit, you know, what you needed. And you can see Rob, Rob, uh, Stephen Wolf and everything, we always joked and everything else, but the training session was tough and also entertaining. But Martin O'Neill, in this case, it was by Thursday, Friday, he was maybe coming into the training ground, watched us playing the five sides, whatever we played at the time, and that's it. And for me, it was a very big surprise. I had no clue on Saturday. Is he coming in now on Saturday or not? Or is he going to be on the stand, you know? So Martin really was really kind of not hands-on in terms of training. But when he was uh, on the uh, on the match day, he was on there. That, mm. that you feel Martin really was there. He was, uh, yeah, his passion. When his, things really didn't go well, you can really hear him properly, you know. Uh, then you can see Martin really was uh, hands-on on it. That's for sure. 
I've heard you speaking before, Ramon, about the, the expectation at a club like Celtic is to win every single game. And even, you know, when you, you look down south, some of the big clubs down there don't have the same level of the expectation. And it turns into a crisis if you don't win every game. I mean, actually, as a Celtic player, you only lost two games, and that was after the league was won. I noticed that earlier on today. So you were quite good at winning games at Celtic. Is that something that anybody actually speaks to you about? Or do you just know because of the standards around you that uh, defeat isn't an option? Well, I think more today than before when I was coming to Celtic. Because I think Celtic really done a fantastic, uh, well, in the last 10, 15 years, he was fantastic successful, you know. Obviously, the 10 in a row scenario was, we were talking about it, you know. It's, it's, it's a fantastic achievement, you know, from point, point of view. You know. So, now today, the expectation is, is definitely higher because obviously, when you build up a track record winning trophies with a big club like Celtic, the expectation from the fans and for everybody around wants to win every weekend. And also on top of that, now they want to play well. Because before, they were happy just to win the game. Now they want to win the game and also play unbelievable. So the expectation really, really got higher today than when we potentially played. For us, it, we just broke at that time, that treble winning kind of year. Rangers was leading for eight, nine years at the time. And we came in and just won. That's it. We had a treble winning year, fantastic games. We played well. Everybody was happy. The support was over the moon. We were, we were also very happy as well. But now, 10 years, 15 years later or 20 years later, the game has changed. Celtic has changed as well. It's more successful. or was also more successful in the past. So the expectation for any player that comes to the Celtic is to win in the win trophies. There's no doubt. He has to know that. Mm-hmm. You know when you looked around your, your dressing room and the training pitch and one of your teammates was Neil Lennon who has gone on to manage the club on two different occasions did you see some attributes within Neil Lennon Ramon where you thought he's, he's management material Yes I think in the dressing room what, what I, I see from that dressing room I was at the time you've got Chris Sutton you've got Neil Lennon Paul Lambert who was also a manager John Mialbino we were characters we were kind of really not little boys. We were characters. We were pretty much sometimes we were aggressive against each other when something's not happening on the pitch and dressing room something at half time. I'm not going to say it now here because I always have to stop to swear. Because there was 15 minutes really flying shoes around in something like that. You know, especially Neil Lennon non- or us. We were, we were characters. We wanted to win. We were winning for them. Neil Lennon, I could see already that time, he was really going that direction. He was already guiding kind of some of the players, especially some of the young players who were coming through with us as well. And for us as foreign players, we, we were there as well. We kind of you know, listen to him as well. So you, you could see at the time, if I look back now, that he was going that direction, you know. And I'm actually, you know, uh, not surprised now that he was also very successful because I think he's done a fantastic job for Celtic, to be honest, you know. So, but, you know, it's it's different games now, different year. But uh, I think if you look back what he's done in the past as a player and as a manager for Celtic, I think he's done a very good job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I, again, I look back at the team that you were in, Ramon. What was it like off the park? I mean, was there a good camaraderie? Were you able to socialise away from the training pitch as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I got to know Glasgow for certain. <laughs> That's one thing, you know. I think it's... Uh, I, we had, we, I, I had some fun memories. It's absolutely, you know, Chris Sutton just giving always jokes every day day on the training um, after the training we go for lunches or something like that we really kind of it was a camaraderie always together and I think that was also one of the crucial part of success because it is, is key to success that you are not just a team member but also uh, you, 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 you are together you know you leave every day you train every day you're like a family in a way you know mm-hmm. and once you, you got that spirit into it on a Saturday, when something might not go well, because it happened, that's, that's football for you, you know? But sometimes maybe the first 30 minutes, maybe one or two players right next to you, do, oh, no, it's not that day, you can encourage them. Because you start to know them, why potentially they have that issue today, you know? And, and that makes also a, a very successful team. And I think that's, that's, that's kind of the success we had at that treble winning year because we had some absolutely fantastic characters, you know, really uh, made, made the difference uh, in the dressing room, you know. 
Definitely, and, and part of the success really was the domination over Rangers. I mean, a lot of players come to Celtic or come to Scottish football, and that's the big one you want to play. And you never lost against Rangers, Ramon. That's a record uh, that anyone would be proud of. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I'm very, very proud of that, you know. So, yeah. Absolutely. How do you prepare for a game like that? Again, you know, tension is high. Uh, obviously, you're playing to the packed crowds. It's a massive rivalry. How do you prepare for that game? It's it's. Listen, if I compare now to the London derby, like you know, Spurs, Arsenal, you know, it's always a big, big derbies, you know. And I got used to that four and a half years playing that. You know, you're in, you're out. But when I came to Celtic, and it was my first kind of full firm game, you know, everybody was talking about us, but it didn't how intense a week before, you know, the fans are already kind of full of emotion or even come down to the training ground. So until you don't have it, you don't experience yourself personally, you can't even imagine how intense actually that week before the game is. It was unbelievable. I could never, I couldn't even describe it. I, was, I remember still in the old training ground just off the Celtic Park that we used to walk that, that you know. It was about, oh, about 1,000, 1,500 fans that were already there just on, on, watching us, first of all that, and then just walking back to where everybody was there from, from, from Ireland, from, from, from all around the world. People were coming to watch us. And for me, that was absolutely unbelievable. And I just, I know, and every day was more, more intense. You can hear that even Glasgow as a city was really on fire. You can see the divide between the Celtic and the Ranger supporters, you know. And, and then I actually loved it. It's really that, that intensity of, of, of before the game. And then on the game day, it was like, I was like a little boy, shy nearly, because I never experienced such uh, passion, uh, uh, especially at the park, uh, before coming out of the tunnel, coming out of the sta- into the stadium as a player. It was unbelievable. The intensity, the passion of the fans it, it is something you can't, can't forget it's for me as a player definitely without a doubt one of the most uh, best experience I ever had is these old firm games you can't it's you can't describe but you have to experience and I think as a player but also for people who never watched as a, as a supporter or as a, any uh, old firm you have to watch that because that's just a different different ball game Different program. You liked a goal when you were up at Celtic Park and um, you actually scored against Rangers and it was disallowed. How disappointing on your second game against Rangers was that? Very much. <laughs> Very much. I was really, really hoping to score uh, against them because at that time, Rangers, uh, to be honest, was also a very good team, you know, at the time. And number also, you know, but that's a fantastic team there. The De Beers, all of these guys, you know, really top, top, play- top players they had, you know. Um, and scoring against them, it will be going down to history again for me. You know, not it, it was a shame. I was very disappointed, to be honest with you. At the end of the day, uh, I got a track record not losing against Rangers. For me, that's also a very, very, very good one. I'm very happy, proud about it. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, Barrafield. Uh, you know, that's a historic uh, part of the Celtics um, story as well, as is the kit man when you were there, John Clark. I noticed that you tweeted out about John Clark the other day there. How important are guys like him in, in the great scheme of things at Celtic Park? I just, this is what I was trying to say, you know. I think when I came to Celtic, I, even I have never trained with the players. I remember I've been game uh, right on Friday, afternoon or something like that to Glasgow and suddenly there was a game I never thought in 100 million years I'm going to play my first game I never trained with the players I don't even know all of the names to start with of course some of their three or four guys that's it I say hello in the dinner the night I thought next day that's it I'm going to sit on the bench watch them analyse them etc and then Zach Martin O'Neill two hours before the game mentions my name I was absolutely, first of all, I was afraid because I had no clue with who I'm dealing with, you know, and straight going in the world cold, uh, uh, cold water. But the minute I was announced as a team uh, member, all the other players immediately make you welcome, straight away. And that just that more making welcome make me uh, less nervous to start with. I felt immediately I was there already for six months or more. 
And I think after the game, I showed it as well. I had always the confidence to play with them like I play all the time. And then, of course, scoring two goals in my, in my first game, uh, it was fantastic. It's, uh, it's a memory day. It's definitely uh, something to, to memorize, you know. Again, the, with legends like John, they're very important. There's these, these guys, not just from the experience point of view, the, the humbleness of these people, you know, these players, they're, you, you know, they're top legends for Celtic. They've done a fantastic job for them, you know. They were humble. They were, they were part of a team member. They were like a player to us, you know. Uh, and uh, he was a great gentleman on top of that. I, I can't say anything wrong about that. I actually, I will miss if they're not will be there at Celtic, to be honest with you, because these, these are legends. These are part of Celtic family. Uh, and it's for every single player who comes to Celtic to have to embrace these players. And I think it should be more players that, that be part of Celtic because that's what makes Celtic more so special, make it family. And the players, the new players coming into it has to feel like straight away you're coming into a very, very strong family with passion and emotions, you know. And I think John and all these guys, they really show that to us. And that's what I experienced personally at the time, you know. And I think it's a, it's a very important element for Celtic to have people like that. Oh, definitely, without a doubt, an absolute legend. Now, we won the League Cup by beating Kilmarnock 3-0 at a Larson hat-trick, of course. We wrapped up the league by beating St Mirren 1-0 in the Scottish Cup final against Hibs 3-0. 26 appearances, Ramon, three trophies in 26 appearances, an outstanding record. But the time comes, obviously, after your loan deal. Um, were you looking ahead to the following season, thinking you, you uh, would, would like a crack at the Champions League, perhaps? Oh, absolutely. How how can as a player at that time, Champions League even today, I think it's 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 one of the best you know, play, the place to be as a player, you know. Um first of all, I thought I give quite a lot for Celtic at the time. I played well for them. Uh we won trophies, that's also very important. So for, in my mind, there was not even a doubt to stay at Celtic. There's not even a, wasn't even a question. You know, it was like I was I was thinking I'm going to be part of that at least one year or two years or more. To be honest, in my time, I even remember the time. Listen, sign me for, for life. I stay here because it's, I feel comfortable. Uh, I loved Glasgow at the time. I, I loved the whole environment. I loved Celtic at the time, and I I, I thought I'm going to stay here, but never <laughs> really pretty much came to even to a conversation to potentially stay. And that was my biggest disappointment, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Because I, 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 at that time, thought, what have I done wrong to not deserve to have another year or two years, you know? Yeah, they were saying, I went down to Watford because of the money. No, it wasn't because of money. It was, in, in, you know, Watford was not in the Premier League. It was in the second <laughs> division at the time, you know? Uh, I think Celtic was way much more attractive for position because we can play at the Champions League and so on, you know. So I was expecting even at least sit down and have a conversation, stay for one year, you know, with the option of another one, you know. At that time, I was also 30, 31. For me, it was always important security, how long I'm going to uh, stay, three to four years. Of course, I wanted to have three to four years so I can retire potentially at Celtic, you know. But none of this conversation happens. And that was very, very disappointed. And then it came to the conclusion that I don't think it's going to happen here, Celtic. I was already June and July, and the, the season, well, pre-season started uh, within days. And I said, well, I need to start the pre-season somewhere else. If Celtic doesn't want me because they have first option, because I'm, I'm there, I played with them, mm -hmm. and I never call an offer, then uh, I need to look forward. And that's what you have to do. Unfortunately, I needed to do that at the time. And, and Watford came in at the time with Gianluca Vialli and, and really even waited a, a week later to sign because I really was hoping Celtic wanted to, to sign me off, yeah, sign me uh, at the club. But it never happened. So for me, it was a very big disappointment. Oh, definitely. When you look at your records, it's um, unagreable that you were you were a big success at the club. Twenty six games. You only conceded fourteen goals during that period. It was a domestic clean sweep, and you played alongside people like Valharan and Mialbe. And a big thing this season, Ramon, has been the weaknesses within the central defensive areas at Celtic. Um, how key do you think that has been to our kind of capitulation this year? Very much, very much. I've been following it. Uh, 
from the start. And I think uh, that department was, uh, without a doubt, the weakest in terms of uh, uh, defending some point of view, but also uh, in terms of characters within that defending department. You know, there's no you, – you couldn't see a leader coming in out of over the defence, you know, because sometimes that's what you need to have somebody. We, at the time, as you just mentioned, we had some – Unbelievable defender, Johan Mjolby, Van Gaal and myself. We are three at the back. We were like, uh, we understood each other. We we, we we were talking to each other. We, we, were, we were leaders in, independently to each other as such, you know. We didn't we don't see that today at, uh, at Celtic. And that was definitely without that one of the biggest. The other part is that, that the weaknesses was that kind of connection between the centre-half and the centre-midfield players. These two parts was also not really communicating very well during the whole season, and this that that department has weakened the uh, the Celtic. That's why they also conceded quite a lot of goals because of that. Because if that centre part it's not really organised well, and you don't have a very leading position there, then it's very difficult all the other positions to actually melt into that. That these these two positions, from my point of view, I think was very weak during the whole season. The centre half or the middle and the centre midfield players, and other these parts were very very weak. Mm. There's there's big changes afoot. Um, we've seen some of them being announced recently with regards to Peter Lowell uh, retiring at the end of the season. There's talk about a director of football and perhaps even a change in manager. Now you know Neil Lennon pretty well, having uh, been his teammate for six months. Do you think it's time for a change, Ramon? You came after a really disappointing season, and the change was massive with Martin O'Neill. Do you think that's the kind of transformation Celtic need this time round? <laughs> Listen, I think, uh, first of all, I have to congratulate the CEO uh, because I think he's done a tremendous job for the club, for Celtic. Let's, let's uh, be facts, talk about facts. I think since he came into, into Celtic as a, as a CEO, uh, Celtic was on a winning formula, done a tremendous job for them. Uh, so I have to congratulate to him first of all because he's done a very, very, very good job. Of course, this season I would say was a difficult one because a lot of things really came together. And obviously, the pandemics, with the COVID nineteen, didn't help either. Uh, but at the same time, I think I have to congratulate. He's done a fantastic job for Celtic, and I think uh, I wish him all the best for the future and uh, 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 after Celtic in the summer. When personalities like the aim are leaving. It's clear that there's always going to be a change within the club, of course, because whatever CEO is coming into it, he wants to have it his way, in a way, how to run the club. Of course, he will definitely uh, talk to the ex-CEO whilst in transition period goes in place, but it's now where you're actually talking what you're going to do in the summer, of course. you know, You're not preparing this in June and July. You're preparing already now. We're actually before Christmas already, what are you going to do in the summer? Buy players in terms of the management team and everything else. So from Neil London, Neil London's point of view, again, he's done a tremendous job for the club as a player and also as a manager. There's not many out there who stand for the same club, play for them and also manage those successfully. You know, He had definitely not the best season. That's we can't, we can't go around that. That's a certain. We don't have to uh, talk around it. He knows that himself. He knows that the season is not really going the direction we want to have it. Uh, it's up to him as well, where is he, he has to look himself in the mirror and say, is this for me it in the, su- in the summer? Or does he want to, the Celtic wants to tell, to tell him that he has to leave? Then that's a question about personalities, you know. If you, as a manager, feel that you still have something to get for Salty, then you have to stay. And you have to prove it, of course. That's the only way to do it. But if you feel that this is not my way anymore, this is not the direction it goes anymore, maybe the players doesn't act on me anymore. Mm-hmm. As a manager, you have to be honest about yourself and say, I think this is, that's it. I've done a fantastic job already. He, can't, he can go out of that club, your heads up. There's no doubt. Whatever the season now, good or bad, I think from what he's done until now, he's done a very good job. So he could actually walk out with a very good track record with something, you know. But again, 
people only look at it, what you've done last month, unfortunately, in football. They don't look what you've done 10, 15 years ago. You know, that's the thicker side of football, unfortunately, you know. But for him, it's a question he himself has to answer to himself. Is he prepared to go further? Is he ready to do something like that? The state salty. And and then it's the question of the management team. Do they, do they want to stay with Neil Nellen and go another season and say, okay, we'll give him another job because he's done a good job already until before this season, let's call it, okay? Or they say, we have to change it now and give him the chance to end the season and after that we, we're looking for a new manager. I think the new management team has to look very, very careful with that. Now, we have to look into the same thing. We've got also the economic crisis coming into it. The club has to look into that side as well. Do, do they're going to spend now heavily in the summer for new players because a new manager comes in? Because a new manager comes in, he will have he wants to have his players as well. So it's a conflict there in terms of how much you can spend, how well you're going to manage for next season, but it has to be successful in the same time and competitive. And that's a very tricky way to look it into it, you know. So maybe Milan is the cheapest version to stay potentially because. He has already the players he wanted. He might continue with his play and add some other players in the summer. Or maybe he's completely, say, well, we go to a completely younger manager, even potentially cheaper, give him the chance to him well at something, a big club like that, and then uh, and build up a team for the next two to three years. Because whatever manager new comes into it, it's not just a one-year uh, game, it's a minimum two to three years a build up uh, a scenario as a team, uh, as a players, everything around him, you know. So it's 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 a question of the management team how, how far they want to go in the summer. Do they want to invest or do they don't want to invest? Mm, absolutely. I don't know if they can invest. That's the other question. It's not the only club in, in the world who has uh, potentially financial uh, restriction in terms of because obviously fans can't come in, there's less revenue stream coming into it. So for that point of view, it's a big, 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 the whole goes into it. So you need to be very careful how you manage that club. And I think until now, Celtic was managed with very well on that side, extremely yeah. well. So so we need, as, as, as fans and as followers and supporters, we need to look at that side as well. We want to have Celtic still at the top, but we also don't want Celtic like what happened with Rangers. Going, going bankrupt, you know? So we need to make sure that it's not going to happen that side. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a difficult task to, to do it, but it's definitely doable because I think everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's trying to, to make sure the cheapest version to go into it, not just Celtic, any club in the world at this point now. So that's a good thing is because everybody wants to do a uh, cheapest version the best way. Maybe now is a good time to have the best manager with a, not major salaries with the best players. I mean, those are not major salaries at this time of the period. That's nice. a good to do it, you know. Yeah, yeah, we're moving in out of difficult times, but some troubled waters ahead. I, I would feel, Ramon. What about yourself? What does the future hold for Ramon Vega? Well, at this point, uh, the future holds. I'm like yourself. We are pretty much. Uh, uh, I'm in football involved. That's 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 a uh, fact. I'm not just advising federation football federations around the globe, or football clubs as well, uh, especially on the sporting director side on the view and the CEO level. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely one of the direction uh, I would definitely look into it. I already have some options to potentially go involved in in a football club as either as football director or or, or as a CEO because obviously I'm merging the two financial knowledge and the football uh, together from my uh, past, the last 20 years. So, yeah, this is something I'm actually, uh, at the moment, I'm in discussion with various uh, uh, clubs and federations as well at the same time. I'm on the advisory board of some of them already. Uh, so, yeah, listen, as I say, I'm always uh, uh, here to, to listen if something is interesting where you can see... I can add value, first of all. So I have to see I can add value towards that club and and, and I can build something, you know. So once I see these two opponents, then uh, I definitely will take it seriously and go for it, you know. 
Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Ramon, speaking to a Celtic treble winner, as you certainly were, um, 20 years ago now. And it's great to hear your tales and your memories of Celtic Football Club. All that's left for me to say is, Ramon Vega, thank you very much for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. Thank you very much and uh, good luck. 